Anything I say that I retrospectively don't want to say, I'll be in touch with you. That's the deal, yeah? Mm -hmm. If I don't, do what you like. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very Sounds rarely fair. do I change anything. Nice. Occasionally, because I'm the type of person I am, I'll come out of something and I'll think, mm, <laughs> I call I call my best mate Steve Davis something in an interview <laughs> and I thought, nah. It was funny, but it wasn't really <laughs> usable. We'll, <laughs> we'll come to the other promoters later. <laughs> there, there aren't any. <laughs> For today's episode of Rocket Pod Sports, I'm joined by the founder, former chairman, and now president of Matchroom Sport, Barry Hearn, fisherman extraordinaire, <laughs> boxing promoter, darts promoter, snooker promoter. He's done just about everything in his time. And the founder of Rocket Pod Sports, James Cuss, um, for today's episode here at the wonderful Matchroom HQ, former family home of the Hearns. Yes, yeah. In um, happy house in Essex, yeah, absolutely. Many happy memories of playing football on the lawn, cricket on the lawn, yep. staging fight camp on the lawn during COVID. It's been an amazing place, and I think you know I'm old-fashioned enough to think that some things are lucky, and this is, was a lucky house. My children grew up here. You know, we outgrew it not for size, but for land and things like that we needed. Um, but I'm so pleased I kept it, and it's become a head office where. I'm surrounded by the sound of laughter and all I see is people <laughs> smiling and that'll suit me. <laughs> well, that's because you've got so many uh, anecdotes, Barry, to be well, sure. Well, uh, listen, that's the trouble. This is only an hour and we could do a day. <laughs> we could, we could. This another is time, time, another, another time. time. But you started out as an accountant mm. um, and you also did the cigarette machines with Frank Warren and the snooker halls, right? Warren did s s cigarette machines. Mm -hmm. I smoked in those days, but I never listened to it. <laughs> you smoked right. In addition to my snooker business, I ran a company called Stelka Stanite with right. my boxing pal, Freddie King, mm -hmm. uh, and we dominated the East End of London with all the pool tables, fruit machines, jukeboxes. It was a, a, a sizable business, 2,000 machines out. So we dominated East London. Other families dominated West London, South London, North London. So I, I tried to buy Frank Warren's business, but the, he, he was very small and he wanted much too much money, so the conversation was limited. <laughs> and what's your relationship like these days, if any? Did you ever come across Frank? Because I know that, you know, Matchroom well, and Queen's got, I always got on very well with yeah. Frank socially. I mean, I wasn't a fan of doing business with him. I think we're both of us, you know, we're different type of people. We, we like to control. Yeah. So it doesn't, you know, ITV tried to put us together as a partnership, and I think we did a few shows together. Yeah. And, you know, my memories were were, were okay, you know, but you know, I have a, a plan. I've always had a plan in my head of where I wanted to go to, and he wasn't part of that plan. Mm -hmm. But socially, I would have no problem with him whatsoever. Yeah. And what this has turned into, a matchroom, is an extraordinary business. Are you the... Well, is Eddie and the business now the global promotions company bigger than any other? Really? Yeah, but, I mean, I think so. I don't know whether the size is necessarily a, a reason for success, but quality of what you do is much more important where you'll be judged by the products you sell. But we distribute, we, I think we do somewhere between three and a half and 4,000 hours of live sport a year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amazingly, it's all run out of this building, but obviously we've got other branches around the world and associates around the world that we work with, providing everyone maintains that pursuit of excellence that we seek. And we set very high standards and I hope it's a fun place to work in, you know. So it's certainly the expansion, I have to say, it's since Eddie joined. <laughs> <laughs> difficult to get those yeah. words out. Yeah. I mean, Eddie and I don't compliment each other too much because we're very competitive on everything we do. But uh, the business started in 82, made £67,000 in its first year. And I was quite happy with that, really. Um, but over the years, it lost millions in the 80s and during the recession. And then Sky turned up, as I knew someone would, but I was a few years earlier. Um, and the first phone call or second phone call they made was to me and what, you know, we need events, what have you got? Because uh, I've been in a position of building events in the, dif in the difficult years. And from 1990, I don't think we've made a backward step and grown into a truly global business that, yeah, I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of it. But I'm also respectful of the fact that it's not me, it's the management. I might have some ideas occasionally, but the management of this company is built from the very best in the industry. And 
that's all I can hope for. I was going to say, was it always the plan for Eddie to take it forward, did you sort of thing? And what what input do you have these days, Barry? Mm. I mean, if you go back in 1982, Matchroom was formed as a £100 company. I put in 60 quid for 60%, and I lent Eddie £20 for 20%, and Katie, my daughter, £20 for 20%. That was the shareholders. Um, today, things have changed. The shareholders are the same three people. There isn't anybody else at this stage. It's bound to change. Um, but we've reorganised the company now because I'm 75. Get some great tax advice. Charge you fortunes to save you money when you die. Seems a bit pointless. <laughs> uh, but Eddie now has 45%. Katie has 30 and I have 25 because my time's coming to the end and they have contributed so much more. My daughter very seldom gets recognised, but she was the youngest um, producer of Premiership Football on Sky. She had six years with them and she's... Quietly, she's not a publicity person, you know, she's like a mother, very quiet, but she runs the global sports department that is responsible for syndicating just tens of thousands of hours of sport and does a great job. She doesn't want a profile that people like me and Eddie want with, <laughs> with different type of characters, you know. At 75, where's your motivation come from? And is there still things you want to do in sport? Oh, no, I, well, there's lots of things I yeah. want to do. I have to have projects. I tried to retire. I, I sort of retired 15 years ago. Yeah. So I haven't taken a salary for 15 years. I don't know how I'll let them get away with that. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't need it. So I, I always think that, you know, people talk about wealth and, and the people with no wealth have ideas that if they had wealth would be different. Mm. And I'm probably the same. Growing up, you know... I, mean, I told you off camera, when I sold my snooker was in 82, I got one and a half million pounds. And I thought, that's it, I'm done. Million and a half, I've never seen, I've never had, not had an overdraft. But of course, time goes on and yeah. that's probably not, not really enough to retire. But what I did find is I missed the business. I missed the deals, I missed the drive. I missed getting up in the morning and thinking and taking my pulse and it's going up five points because I'm excited yeah. about every day. Yeah. Weirdly, mm. I'm exactly the same today. Yeah. So my pulse rate still goes up every time I drive through the gates. Does it? Because I see opportunity everywhere. Yeah. And I see how we can get better everywhere. And as I said earlier, you know, it, for me, business has always been a game. Initially, you break the rule. You know, when you start off with nothing, this is why I'm such a big fan of Eddie, because he has, he has someone to follow. Mm. My dad was a bus driver. It was very difficult for me to fail in life, if, if you judge it on that basis. If I was a conductor, bus conductor, I'd done well. <laughs> so I was under never any pressure. Yeah. I see a lot of people around like that. They say, how did you take all those risks? Because I had nothing to lose. Actually, it's more difficult now to take risks because you think, I'm losing. And I'm going backwards in the game. The game of business, the game of life, the game of sport is about winning. Mm. And winning comes, it's not about how much. You know, it sounds, you know, if you're sitting at home and you, you can't pay your mortgage, mm. you listen to that and think, what a load of bollocks, you know? But trust me, when you get to that stage, mm. it is the thrill of competition at any level that makes you get out of bed in the morning. So where, where did that drive, that hustle come from? My like mother. You okay. My mother was unbelievable. I'm looking back on my mother because I said, I'm reflective. Mm -hmm. So my dad was a bus driver, had his first heart attack at 28, you know, six heart attacks and he died at 44. Right. He had virtually no impact on my life. The only thing he ever said to me because of his medical condition was, and it's probably the best advice I've ever had, was don't waste a second. So to this day, today, tomorrow, next week, I guarantee I will not waste one hour of my life because it's precious. And that's what my father taught me. My mother, on the other hand, wanted me to be a better person. We come from council estates in the East End. They were what they were. No sob stories. I was happy. You know, as a kid, you had love in the house. Didn't matter. I didn't know people had proper shoes and I didn't know people had indoor toilets until I was five or six years old. Later on, I saw things that I, I thought, I questioned. Why haven't I got a big house? Why haven't, I, why haven't we got a car? You ask those sort of questions of yourself. My mother, on the other hand, she was a bit of a working class snob. She was a child lady, so she used to clean people's houses. 
and she always wanted, she came home one day when I was 12 years old and she said, when you grow up, you're going to be a chartered accountant. I'm living in a two bedroom council house, sharing a bedroom with my sister. I'm like, what's the chartered accountant? She said, I have no idea. She said, but the man whose house I cleaned told me today that you never see a poor one. And that phrase stuck okay. in my mind. And from there, she, her drive, which, no reason why she should have it. She had no background, no education, but she enrolled me in elocution lessons. As you can see, they didn't work, but she wanted me to be, speak better. Yeah. Then she put me in the Amateur Dramatic Society when I was 13. <laughs> so I was doing Bertolt Breck and Shakespeare plays. Then when I was 14, she put me in the Verse Appreciation Society. I was traveling around schools and I specialized in T.S. Eliot, Robert Graves, people like that. Looking back on it, it, was, it also taught me to fight a bit because everyone took the piss out of me at school. So you get a bit violent, you know? <laughs> and, but looking back on it, it gave me that feeling of confidence in myself that yeah. I could stand up and I could deliver. Yeah. And I think she was a lot smarter than I ever gave her credit for. And uh, it's funny how she never lost her work. I mean, she's blessed past now, obviously, but she came to this house in 1982 when I bought it. And I was, uh, <laughs> I can remember getting quite choked of thinking, she's going to be really proud of me. You know, look at this, where we come from. Look at this, you see London. <laughs> and she looked at me and she went, are you doing anything illegal? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, yeah. And to the day she died, I said, Mum, I'm a child of the cannon. We, we make terrible gangsters. She never <laughs> believed me. She always believed I was doing something illegal to the day she died. And in a way, that was sad, but in a way, I can understand where she came from. She couldn't contemplate someone from our background having so much success, perhaps so early, you know? 1982, I was 34 years old, and the world was my oyster, married, you know, a couple of kids, everything was perfect. But, you know, the next 10 years was very tough. But you don't have to pay a price in anything, which is the same principle of a game, you know? You have to sacrifice, you have to dedicate, you have to work hard, you have to have a focus beyond the norm, mm -hmm. or you just get overrun by the competition. And, you know, and that wasn't acceptable. She always gave you a kind of a purpose, you know? Um... Yeah. Yeah, I always wanted things, you know, I mean, I started my first business when I was 13. I got some kids at school and things like that, you know, washing cars, cleaning windows, doing gardening, babysitting, okay. anything to make a pound. I went on the, I mean, I went on the doors. It wasn't, it wasn't a tough guy door. It was like school, school time doors. But I made a few, everything to make a few quid. Yeah, so you had that on, entrepreneurial always, spirit. Always, always. Beginning. Because I realised years earlier, I knew I was never going to be the brightest candle in the room. But what my mother gave me was a work ethic mm -hmm. that meant that I burnt longer than anyone else. So to beat me, I am beatable, but you have to pay a terrible price to beat me. And most people get lost along the journey. I haven't lost my focus. Even now, I mean, matching is worth a considerable amount of money, obviously. but. So what I look on that as part of the journey, the journey's not complete. Mm. You know, Eddie, Katie, the team here will take it to the next level. Eventually it'll go to another level. But I don't set boundaries. I just, I'm quite a, a fairly religious man that believes in God and says, let's just roll the dice and God will take us where he wants to take us. And sometimes he gives you a little slap round the ear he gave me late Norian. I thought, <laughs> if he loved me, he would have never given me late Norian. But, but, you know, I look around my, my whole life now, he's looking around feeling grateful for what I've got and to make sure that I don't abuse my position, but I benefit from it. And that's a longer term strategy. But, you know, it's good business, good fun. I have a question for you. So um, you talked about being, you know, you're very pragmatic. You write things down. Mm. Um, obviously, became a you're a child of the accountant. Mm. During the the eighties, when you're using you know, losing millions of pounds, um, you've got to have considerable nerve to, to kind of go through that time. Did you, you you mentioned that you could see the light at the end of the tunnel? 
uh, but you must have, have, did you build a war chest mm. to weather the storm? Did you plan financially to actually I thought weather I had, those, that downturn? I thought I had a war chest. <laughs> and then bit by bit, I lost a lot more. It, the troubles went, it, my previous, before I became chairman of the Snoogles, I was in the fashion business. I was finance director of a big fashion textile design company. And part of that job was traveling around the world negotiating contracts, because I was quite good at that. I can talk, I can hold my own conversation about money. Uh, and I learned a lot. And one of the things I learned was spending a lot of time in America, I, I turn on my TV and see ESPN. It's like wall to wall sport. I thought, I, I couldn't, why haven't we got this in the UK? I remember, uh, I won't mention his name because I don't want to embarrass him, but I remember an Irish snooker player who I took to Canada once for the Canadian Open. And he went upstairs and we was having a drink and he came running down the stairs. He said, I, I, have you been in your room? I said, no, not yet, just having a beer. And I said, my TV's got about 50 channels. <laughs> so I said, yeah, yeah, this is what it's like over here. He said, I'm taking one of these TVs home. And I said, we all sort of looked at him. And they, don't, they don't necessarily work. But the principle of giving people what they wanted, and sports fans want live television, and they want entertainment in their own house. There's nothing rocket launching about that. But we didn't have it in the UK. So as a young promoter, you know, wanting to do events, if I got 15 minutes on BBC Grandstand on a Saturday afternoon, I'd done well. Yeah. But it wasn't enough because I knew sports fans, sport is a drug that once you start watching it, you want to watch more and more. And our job is to make it entertaining so people enjoy the experience. Or when they come to an event, they want to buy a ticket to come back again. It's not rocket science. But we weren't like that. And then I started thinking, well, we will be like it. And when we get there, I will have a whole load of sports events ready to go. Here you are. And no one else was investing. But whether it was snooker, whether it was pool, what, temping, but whatever it was. But of course, that cavalry didn't arrive until Sky arrived in 1990. And I think I ran out of money in about 86. And from then on, it was me and the banks and 17% okay. interest. But in the back of my mind, you see, I had that security blanket of, I'm a, I'm a chartered accountant. And I, I was pretty, obviously, you'd expect me to say it. I was good. No, I was great. Um, <laughs> but in the back of my mind, there was always something to go. I was never going to starve. It wasn't like the gamble of a 17-year-old leaving school and saying, I'm going for it. Or I'm going for it with dad's money or something like that. I mean, that's why I'm a fan of Eddie's because what he's done is he's taken that mantle on and shown that his own ability means he's worth his money and it's not dad's. Because it doesn't work like that in our family, you know? Mm. He's mm. got to stand on his own two feet. But for me, uh, during those years were terrible years. Mm. I mean, terrible. I can't describe to you how bad they were because it wasn't so much the money I was losing or the problems with the banks. It was that the dream was fading. You know? And you had this focus of, as you say, the light at the end of the tunnel. Is that a train coming towards me or is that what I believe is going to happen, that I think we will see a proliferation of sports channels. I never saw streaming at such at that stage, but it's a natural development. I saw pay-per-view, you know. I want to be there, I want to be a player, I want to dominate the market. But to do that, you have to survive. Right. So that was your focus then? My focus was survival. I would come in my office every day. I would not leave that office until I sent someone, somewhere, an invoice. And it might be for 500 quid for a dozen cues, or it might be £5,000 for a personal appearance for Steve Davis. But I would not leave my office seven days a week until I sent. And that was how I survived. And that work ethic during that right. troublesome period mm. is what has set me yeah. up and really taken me through okay. the so, next yeah. 30 years. Relentlessness. Relentless. Yeah. Total. So okay. which of those sports over the years has given you the most pleasure, oh, Larry, would you say? Oh, oh, I, equally. I, I'm so, I'm so blessed and so spoiled yeah. that I don't do things for money. I know it sounds ridiculous because I love making money. I've never, ever done a sport that I don't love. Mm -hmm. So therefore, why do I do Fishermania for 30 years on Sky? I love fishing. <laughs> and so do millions of other people. And I think I can do it better than anyone else. Mm. I always love boxing from seven years old. I can remember under my bedclothes, 
listening to Rocky Marciano against oh, whoever, Archie Moore. That was the first fight I ever listened to. And later on, I listened to my first Muhammad Ali fight I listened to was Muhammad Ali against Archie Moore as well. Really. <laughs> but I always wanted to be heavyweight champion of the world myself. I was okay, I could look after myself. But when I had a go at it, I found out I was absolutely useless, which was a bit of a career setback, really. <laughs> but, but all of the things, you know, we have our heroes. And, I, and again, you learn things in life, you know. We had our heroes, whether it was you know, Freddie Truman, Brian Statham, Mowgli the Bowling for England, or whether it was Henry Cooper, Rocky Marciano, Muhammad Ali. The essence of what you try to do with sport is to build heroes. And I don't think UK, I think global. So I want to build heroes in the Philippines. I want to build them in Germany. I want to build them in well, Bosnia, wherever. And it's all built on the criteria of ability, but on the ability also to entertain. And that principle came early doors, you know. I would go and watch amateur boxing at the Royal Albert Hall all day for the ABAs. Then I would, and even then I used to walk out thinking if I watched the professional shows, they weren't very good. Yeah. They were mismatches. They were just nicking my money. And, you know, five are here, five are there. I wanted value. And I always had the dream that one day I'll do it and I'll do good shows. And, I, you know, listen, no one gets it right all the time, but you should, have the, you should try to get it right all the time. In the old days, it was cynical exploitation of the working class. You like your boxing, Charlie Magri's fighting, you like Charlie, give us a tenner for a ticket. You know, that's OK. But I want to see fights as well. You know, I want to be entertained. And today's market is much more built on entertainment than even on ability. Absolutely. You must look at boxing and the influence of boxing and things that have crept in over the last few years. It's, it's an incredible entertainment business, isn't it? But what do you kind of make of boxing 2023 barriers as a landscape? Well, you summed it up. It's an incredible entertainment business. I mean, I don't think anything beats the night of the darts. I don't think anything creates more drama than a night of the snooker. But nothing creates that sexy, hard-driven, hard-won appreciation of, of watching two men fight. Mm. Mm. I don't think that makes us particularly good people. I, don't, I think it's a bit prehistoric in, in today's woke world yeah. that we're watching two people trying to dismember each other. Yeah. Yeah. But it is an amazing experience and things that will live in your memory forever. You know, I remember watching the 66 World, World Cup final on, on TV in Italy. I was living on the beach in a hut, you know, a camp, little tent. I thought that was the greatest day of my life, 66, yeah. just watching it on TV. Yeah. And I think AJ versus Klitschko, something that I'll, I'll take with me to the grave, I think, in one of the great fights. But then there's thousands of them. What do I make of the way the sport's developed? I think it doesn't matter what I make of it. I think the customer and the viewer make their own mind up, and quite rightly. I wouldn't personally pay to go and watch a YouTuber fight or a mis misfit fight because it doesn't do anything for me. Mm. I've known a lot of tough guys in my life. Mm. I've seen some good fights outside pubs at closing time, most of them better than that stuff. Or in the bar at the York Hall. Wherever. <laughs> or wherever you want to be. You yeah. Know. yeah. But that doesn't impress me. But at the same time, if people want to do it, good luck to them. Yeah. If they can earn a load of money, good luck to them. Because it's a tough old world out there. And they've got families to keep and they've got to be provided. When I was growing up, fighters used to fight to put me on the table for their family. Yeah. Today, they're superstars. And I'm pleased. Mm. I'm pleased they're earning the money they're earning. Because I couldn't do it. And, I, and I, I enjoy watching it. I get upset sometimes if I think someone's trying to con me. Yeah. Or, you know, I remember Mickey Duff once saying about one of his heavyweights, he, sh he shouted at the end of the round, he shouted out, well done, son, you're doing just enough to lose. <laughs> and, you know, I don't, you know, we're talking about commitment. In my life, I make total commitment to everything yeah. I do. Yeah. Whether that makes me good or bad, I don't really care. Yeah. But I expect that commitment from others. And boxing's in a good place in terms of Fighters that used to provide a lot of entertainment, retired with nothing or retired with very little and either got himself in trouble or lived a bad life or whatever. That, there's no excuse for that today. The fighters, if they've got ability, will get well rewarded. And most of them now have got good advisors around them, the majority anyway. Um, and, and 
and they will be able to look back on boxing and say, boxing gave me that. You know, I look at my life and say, people say to me, don't you feel it's a bit sad, you know, you worked 60 hours a week, 80 hours a week for the last 45 years. And I look around and say, my life gave me this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and that's, that'll do me. Are you enjoying retirement? And what are you doing with your kind of, more of your time now, Barry? I don't know. I don't think I have retired at all. I mean, I do, I do. It's funny, I just do what I want to do. And yeah. that's the ultimate retirement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, to have the joy, the freedom of choice. And, you know, I'll, I'll just disappear. Last week I went to a pal's house in Italy and just fished his lake for five days. Got up at half past five every morning, caught one fish, <laughs> lost it just about where you're sitting. <laughs> but I loved it. I mean, that's why I call it fishing and not catching. Because you just go to fish, don't you? So I do, I'm totally spot. I do what I want to do every single second of my life. As my wife reminds me, yeah. I'm a selfish bastard. But I, work, I put in a good shift. So anyone who thinks that's offensive to them, unlucky. Yeah. I put in a good shift and now I'm going to enjoy what time God's going to give me. And hopefully it's going to be a long time. I'm injured at the moment, so I can't play cricket at the moment. I'm absolutely gutted. I went to watch a match yesterday. I played for the Essex over 70s. I've had a few good years there and I'm watching it. I was gutted yesterday. But I've got a back and a knee problem that has to be resolved with surgery. And until then, I can't play. I'm gutted. But I'm still keeping, I keep reasonably yeah. fit. You know, yeah. I work out most days. I, you know, it's part of the price you pay to live a bit longer, so. Yeah, yeah. Were you a batter, a bowler, wicket keeper? What would you expect? I'm all round. If I could be a wicket keeper <laughs> at the same time, I'd do that. I'm not quick enough to get to the ball by the time I bowl it. I like to be involved. I like competition. I, I prefer one-to-one -one competition, but, but team competition is still good for me. I like there being a reason for it. A reason for doing certain things is you earn your living by it. A reason for playing sport is you want to be the best you can be. I think I apply the same process to both parts of my life. I want to be the best I can be. I know I'm never going to be a genius. I know I have limitations. I've lived with them and tried to improve throughout. Yeah. And what you see is what you get. I, I, I can't make it any easier than that, you know. What am I going to do? I mean, I have people, I'm very honest. Mm. As I've got more honest as I've got older and I don't really care. I don't try and upset anybody. I just want to tell them the truth. And sometimes they don't like it. Tough, you know, that's yeah. how I like that. Yeah. What you said earlier about, um, you know, like coming into work and you said your, your pulse rate goes up high and bet everyone's smiling and having a laugh. Of course, everyone's working hard, but um, I mean, that is you know, quite nice to have. You know, you're going to build this. I think you can change people's lives. And I think one of the, the appeal of sport to me is, has been a little bit of that as well. I mean, you do have responsibilities. It's not a question of just coming into a situation, nicking all the money and going home, is it? I mean, that's the old Scrooge story, you know, and all he's got around him is sadness and grey. I don't like grey, I like blue. You like to have fun. Too. Yeah, and I like, I love looking at, I mean, I've got to be a legendary people now, but. You know, Frank Smith, who's headed the second in command on boxing, joined us when he was 15 or 16 years old, running, running around, serving cups of coffee to people playing poker in one of our events. He's now a massive name in international boxing, changed his life, and, and I, my job is to reward him accordingly, which I think he, I'm sure he's very happy with. Matt Porter joined X, you know, he was a local news reporter. Oh, really? Went to Lake Norrin's press officer, impressed me, I gave him. Chief Executive of Lake Norrin. I, I like giving people responsibility, and some of them fail. But you don't find out if you can sing, swim, until you jump in the swimming pool, do you? Um, yeah, I'm interested actually in your um, relationship with trust and actually putting that trust in people. Mm. Um, what is your relationship with trust, and, and do you look for something in, in people, whether it's business or sports? Yeah, no, is there I, something? I always you just... look in the eyes. I see it in you a bit. It's funny, isn't it? I don't even know who you are. <laughs> but you see, you've got a little bit of a, a glint. <laughs> For some reason, you're enjoying your life in some ways, or whatever. Not, I'm not going to lay you out on the couch and analyse you, but I look at people, and in a conversation in five minutes, I will tell you whether they're going to be my type of people. You know? I, said, I said to Matt Porter when he was press officer at Lake Norrie, you know, you have ability. 
And he was smart. He was out of university and whatever. He was smart. I said, how would you like to be chief executive of Lake Norman Football Club? It's not the biggest, not Spurs. It's not Manchester United. He said, I'll be honoured. But that does me so. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. From then on, once he's developed and he's taken, he's played a massive part in taking darts to a level that no one else could have ever anticipated. I think darts is my greatest ever success because there we've changed the whole spectrum of working class sport. You know, when people look down, what I call the so-called posh bin with the fur coat, no knickers mob, darts. Oh, fat people smoking cigarettes and drinking beer. No. It's community leaders inspiring other kids to apply themselves and dedicate their life. And if you don't like it, these guys are now earning millions and millions a year more than you for playing darts. <laughs> and, that, and, and by the way, we're the second biggest sport on Sky Television. And by the way, we're getting bigger and bigger and bigger and we will be the new golf. Mm. Live with that because the world's changing and it's about ability. Ability drawn from a level playing field. I don't care what school you went to, what university, I just care how good you are. And if you're no good, the door's over there. Enjoy whatever you do in your life. God bless, but you're not for me. Hey everyone, if you're enjoying this episode and want to see more like this, it would help so much if you could heart, vote in the poll, and ask us a question if you're listening on Spotify rate and leave a review if you're listening on apple podcasts and the usual like comment and subscribe if you're watching on youtube and of course wherever you're watching share this to your circle so we can all learn and grow together back to the episode anthony joshua is one of many people you've yeah. obviously had in here you and eddie over the years to sign yeah. in this very room i imagine sat there um He's been such an integral part of the matchroom business, hasn't he, over 10 years? I think he epitomises a lot about what the business is about. I have a great deal of time for Anthony Joshua, not as a fighter, although I admire him, but as a person. And I like the way he goes about his life. I like the way he, initially he was very cautious, conservative, didn't trust. You could see the distrust in his eyes. Because he went around all the promoters, didn't anyway, he? And that was Eddie's idea. Yeah. I yeah. wanted to pressurise Anthony as soon as he won to sign that because <laughs> I don't like to postpone things. Yeah. And Eddie, brilliant call, yeah. brilliant, said, no, Dad, Dad, don't do that. Don't put it. If you put this kid under pressure, he'll walk away. He said, let him go and see. He's intelligent enough for us to rely on his analysis. And he went all around the world, saw everybody, and came back and said, I want to sign with you. And he's been our massive asset to us. Not, look, monetary-wise, yeah, we've made some money out of Anthony Joshua. Big deal, I made money out of everybody. So what? Yeah. I've, he's been a part of our life. He's been a part of our family. We've signed a contract with him now where he will be involved with us beyond his boxing career because mm -hmm. I think he can add a huge asset to my business as his personality develops. Mm -hmm. He sat in that chair and listened to the pitch after he'd signed. He sat there and he said, what do you... Just, I've signed now. Mm. Tell me the truth. He said, what do you want out of me? And I went, I want 1% of your adrenaline. He said, what does that mean? I said, when you walk out of Madison Square Gardens, I want 1% of what's going through your body. When you win the world title, when you unify the titles, I want 1%. He said, Eddie will sort out the money. I don't care about that. And he has never under-delivered. Of course, we've had disappointments along the way. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what life's about? We don't live in a world where you get what you want all the time, no matter who you are. Mm, mm. You know, the Queen never got it. No, I don't get it, second to the Queen. You know? <laughs> but yeah. it's just, I like the way he carries himself. Yeah. And I like the, re a key word in my life from early doors has been respect. Yeah. You know, you grow up in an environment, you meet people, some of them you might not care for. But there should be a respect level. And if anyone breaks the respect level to you, then they should be treated accordingly and vice versa. So in all my life where I have met and dealt with lots of people from strange backgrounds, I've never had a problem with anybody, ever. And I think the reason is not because I'm a tough guy, because I'm not. But I have respect and I expect respect from other people. And I think Anthony Joshua epitomises that. We don't necessarily have a lot in common, 
He has his own life, he has his own taste, he has his own world. But there's a level of respect that joins us at the hip, and I'm grateful for his company. Do you think he can have a golden kind of finale to those oh, remaining years? Toss of a coin. Wilder, Fury, those oh, fights. Listen, it's show business. I mean, Fury, does he really want to fight? He didn't want to fight Usyk, doesn't want to fight AJ. But he will, in time, fight all of them. And the fans will say, oh, they're not at their peak. So what? Mayweather and Pacquiao weren't at their yeah. peak. Yeah. It grossed about $800 million or something. So yeah, no, it's, it's a business. It's a business. I think he's got some mental scars in his head mm. about what went wrong with Ruiz. Yep. Who saw that coming? I certainly didn't. I booked a restaurant for nine o'clock. Uh, you know, <laughs> but life does that. Yeah. And it's how you deal with it defines you as a person. Yeah. Failure is something that everybody must endure at some stage. It's how you deal with it that defines you as a person and the character you have. He is a technician. He's thinking all the time. I mean, I thought a couple of few of the rounds against Hellenius was outright boring. Mm. And that was a feeling shared by some of the crowd, apparently. But I can also make a case to say, if I was getting ready to fight Deontay Wilder, that's exactly the fight I'd fight. Yes. So maybe we were, maybe am I giving him too much credit? Maybe it was a dry run. You know, the jab, the movement, try not to get hit, keep at range. And when it's right, when that opening comes, don't force it. Because in his brain will say, last time I forced it, I got caught with a shot. That was, that was sloppy. Schoolboy error. But the enthusiasm of the kill, when you've had a career built up of a series of kills, the brain accepts that that is the way forward. Now he's got a different aspect to his brain. Whether the trainer makes any difference or not, I don't know or care. If, I believe he can fight Deontay Wilder next, I hope. I think they're close-ish, but you're never there until the sign. No. And I think it's a 50-50 fight. If anything, I'm erring towards Joshua, but I'm not saying that Wilder is a very dangerous man. As a purist, which I am occasionally, I don't think Deontay's very good, mm. technically. I don't think his feet are good. I don't think his balance is good. But he's a dangerous motherfucker because he can punch and he can take you out in one shot. I think he doesn't land on Joshua. I think the new Joshua can deal with it. But, you know, it's just another chapter in this wonderful story of sport. It's not going to change the world. It's not going to cure poverty. It's not going to get us to the moon faster. It's just a fight. And it's a fight the whole world will want to see, so let's get it on. Yeah. Well, yeah, obviously, AJ was meant to fight Dillian White um, yeah. on the 12th. We, we've had a lot of negative stories, haven't we, from boxing? Yeah, how, did, how does boxing deal with that barrier? I don't think it ever does. No. I mean, I can almost see a case where they say, take what you like. Really? Take what you like, because at the moment, I don't know whether it's scientist versus scientist or boxer versus boxer or an over-calculated procedure where minute sections of some... I just don't know, mm. you know, and I don't really want to know. I have an opinion of athletes that are on a pedestal. They're my heroes. Drugs, to my mind, are cheating, and I know the people involved, and I can't really see them as the type of cheats that I would identify. Conor Ben's another one. Yeah. I've known Conor Ben, I've known his dad, I've known the whole family, you know, mad as hatters, but they're not cheats. And if there's a reason for it, then they're losing their livelihood for the wrong reason. And if it's not, then perhaps they should never be allowed in a ring again. I mean, Dylan White, fine. You know, he's had other things in the past. Mm. I won't say I'll get bored with it, but I'm so frustrated because I don't know the answer. I don't know anyone, including some dickheads on the radio, that don't have a really strong opinion. But I've never valued an opinion from an ignorant person. I have strong ideas on brain surgery, but I wouldn't recommend you let me operate on you. <laughs> I love that. I'll bear that in mind. That's brilliant. Yeah. Um, you know, just in terms of that, does boxing need a, an umbrella governing body? Something to kind of keep the, the sport in check, do you think, Barry? Is there a wider... I think I'm so cynical. I think it is what it is. Yeah. Every time I see an umbrella company, I see misuse of power further up right. the, the feeding chain. Right. You know, I mean, 
You always hope for the best, but you have to operate fearing the worst. And that's life. So just take the attitude that I take in life is be the best you can. Don't expect to win every argument and just get on with it, will you? And stop being so boring. <laughs> I've got all these barrack room lawyers with opinions. It's like the old bloke when I was growing up, always sat in the corner of the pub telling me what the manager should be doing for the football <laughs> team and how he should go out and spend this and do that. I look at him and think, mate, your arse is hanging out your trousers and you're telling me how to run them out. But, but then again, we live in a democracy and everyone's allowed their opinion. It's just not mine. And if it's not mine, it don't count. How powerful, you know, this organisation that you and then Eddie have built upon here, how powerful a match room in terms of boxing and in, in that sporting world now? Because you're not, you're not just a, you know, a small hall promoter. No, because I, I, I mean, I always say, and I'm not being rude, is that the world's built up with lots of different enterprises, you know. The, the, the shop on the corner does a great job for the community. Transfer that to might be your call shows, you know. Tesco's, Asda, whatever, mm. which is what we are comparatively to the opposition. And I'm not being big-headed, it's factual. I mean, we live in this era of building people up, and I don't think financial is necessarily a way to value it. I think ethics, integrity, honesty, it's all simple. But I don't know anyone that gets anywhere close to us. And when you look at the old, I mean, bless him, I look at Don King's career and Bob Aaron's. I mean, Bob Aaron is my hero. He's 93 years old. <laughs> he works harder than I do. Yeah, yeah. He's made some money, but he's never really made the type of change that Eddie's trying to make. I mean, he's got things coming up in the next few months which are just going to blow everybody because he is a global promoter. Mm. And we tend to be, and podcasts as well, and they're all at fault, we tend to concentrate on our back garden, don't we? Yeah. Our back yeah. garden is England. But, you know, trust me, there is another world out there. Yeah. And England can be a leader in that world in some ways, depending on ability, and that applies to promoters as well. There's good promoters in England. Warren's a good promoter. I don't know Shalom well, but he does shows as well and does all right, I think. Do they have the vision, really? Mm. No, no, they're not in the same world. They're not, you know, and, and they won't agree with that, but they don't see outside their little goldfish bowl. There is a world, there's an ocean out there, not a goldfish bowl. And it's exciting because you can get it wrong as well. Yeah. And you can make mistakes and you've got to be prepared to risk substantial sums of money. I mean, during COVID, because we build sustainable businesses, no one suffered. We did more events during COVID than we do without COVID. Mm. Because we employ effectively thousands of sportsmen and women who are self-employed. We didn't do fights, we didn't do snooker matches, darts. Mm. They got no money. And that's our responsibility. Mm. And you have to be big enough to take that responsibility. Don't put your head in the sand and say, wake me up when it's over, <laughs> which is what 90% of British sport do. What you did is fascinating this because there's an insight into business. So my profits went down 25% during two years of COVID. Yeah. They doubled the year after COVID because of the lessons we learned, the work we put in and the reason. And we realized there's no limitations. We're only limited by our own imagination. So why don't we do? I don't know if you realise, we were doing darts tournaments on people's iPhones. <laughs> filmed all around the world yeah. with no referees, no judges, in their <laughs> kitchens. And they were shouting out game, and you couldn't even see it because <laughs> the picture quality wasn't great. But we made a lot of money on it because we sold it to TV companies that didn't have any programming. Eddie was a fight camp, was another one. Snooker said, well, we don't really need a crowd. Mm. Yeah. That's brilliant. We can just do events and keep people working. Yeah. I have a question for you. So in the break, um, I asked you how you instilled the drive into Eddie. You know, how does someone from an affluent background instill the drive into their children? And you, and you answered... I don't know. I, you, when, you, when you actually answered, it was an answer I wasn't expecting at all. Um, as far as you going head to head with Eddie. Yeah. Um, and then you talk about the vision for... Um, you know, the business and, and your company. Who, you know, who is Eddie? Um, the vision that he has for, the, for Matchroom. It's interesting, even now, you see, the next generation, as you say, 
It did surprise me. I didn't know really he had it in him. He can have it, he can. He says, he's my son, I love him to death, my daughter I love to death, whatever they want. That's dad's responsibility. Get anyone with children, tell you the son. You want them to be nice people, but most of all, they're your children. Now I've got a generation beyond that, and these are princesses, you know. We play table tennis, fairly regularly. I don't let them win one point, they're in tears. Okay, 11-0, <laughs> 11-0, 11-0. Now, over the years, it's getting closer and closer, and they're getting... But I say to them, I say, Bazza, they all call me Bazza. Can't you just let me win a point? I went, no. When you win a point, you would have done it on your own. Yeah. I'm not giving you anything. And now it's getting... I'm still winning, I'm still undefeated, but it's getting close. One of them's 14, she's got a bit more ability, you know, and she will win. I said, when you win, you've, you feel... And I believe they will feel that sense of achievement. And in a way, it's like business. You know, when you come into this business, you've got ideas. Okay. I'll give you, I, I can only, the same as I talk about with men and women, sports men and women around the world, I can't make you win. I can give you opportunity and I will make a profit out of that opportunity because otherwise I will not be sustainable. So that doesn't, you know, short term, that never appeal to me. I'm not a short term player. I'm a long term player, longer than you know. And that's why I stick with things for a long time, if I believe in them. And that's the same I'm trying to put into the kids. You know, at the moment, they're spoiled and rotten. It's interesting, yeah. My 10-year-old yeah. ten grandchild shows great signs on, in football. She's improved in 12 months, like I can't see anything like it. But time will tell how much she wants it. And it's that desire inside you that I don't believe you can necessarily install. I think it comes from your DNA. I'm, ho I'm hoping it does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In terms of changing and new generations, the Saudi money is such a big game changer for sport, not just boxing, isn't it? As well, look at the football. So many players going over there. Huge, huge money. Million pound a week to the top players. How well, difficult is that, Barry, when that sets the financial bar so high? It's you know, not a barrier. It's not a barrier. I mean, you just take the view that you do the best you can do. Mm. So my job is to get the most money I can get. Mm. But it doesn't mean to say if Saudi pay X, that Belgium's going to pay the same. You'd have to decide. And the view for me has always been a global view. At the moment, the Middle East is spending probably more money than anyone else in the world. We're very close to a new 10-year deal signing with the Saudis on snooker and pool. Mm -hmm. And that deal may change the whole sport for the rest of the world. So they're part of this jigsaw yeah. of putting together a successful enterprise. But, like everything, it's built on money, isn't it? Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. This is why I love darts and the fact that, you know, I think oh, I'm proud to say when we started with darts, the total global prize money was $500,000. So it's over 20 million now. But I look at it and think, I've got to get to 30 as quick as possible. And then I know I'm going to go, well, let's jump 40 and let's go straight to 50. Mm -hmm. you know, and then that's how I set my standards. And obviously the players are happy if I make it and yeah. they're disappointed if I don't. But if they're on your side, it's, it's fun as well. I mean, it's, I, I can't describe it. I mean, it's not... It's everything about money and it's nothing about money, if you follow. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, is there a sport you'd like to get involved with that you've not done yet? Have you had offers where you've gone, no, uh, not for us? Oh, hundreds, hundreds. Rugby league was one, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, rugby league, Scottish football. Oh, yeah? Uh, horse racing, speedway, um, wow. greyhound racing. They're not right. And some of those sports don't have a future. Mm -hmm. Some of them. Some Is that why you would choose yeah. to sort of yeah, sidestep? I, I, I'm playing a game. Yeah. I want to win. I don't win by taking something 5% more. Mm -hmm. If I'm not passionate about it, how can I spend my time, which is the only limiting factor in my life, how can I spend that time on something I'm not passionate about? That's a waste of time. Yeah. So do something you're passionate about. But there are, there are. I mean, I'm very excited about global nine ball pool. And people may say, well, what's that, you know? It's a massive global game that no one's ever really done anything with. Oh, happy days. I've got no one to beat. Yeah, yeah. You know, so now I'm putting together, I've got 50 events globally this year. I'm upsetting a lot of people. I'm annoying a lot of people. The institutions and the associations hate me. 
I love that. Because it starts looking like a fight again. <laughs> and, and adrenaline. For, and for once, this is a fight I can win. Yeah. You need a Ronnie O'Sullivan for Paul, do you, presumably? Well, it's sort well, of for characters. There's loads of characters there. Is but, you see, Ronnie O'Sullivan is a good example. I mean, as, mu as much as Snooker needs in, he needs the snooker platform, doesn't he? Because yeah. otherwise, who's Ronnie O'Sullivan? Yeah. So, you know, they're both, I think we've been good for each other in a way. We may not see eye to eye on some things, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. The bigger picture is there. Is the sport bigger? Well, snooker's never been as big as it is now, ever. And Ronnie's got to take a fair share of the credit for that. And, and so have we. What's the, been the toughest challenge, running a football club and everything that comes with that, or dealing with the Don Kings, the promoters of this world? There is nothing to compare with the aggravation of running a small, lower league football club. <laughs> and you get highs that are off the scale. And then, but most of it is pure aggravation. <laughs> and I think we want to know, don't we, James, before we let you go, Barry, who should we be interviewing next? Who do you think we should go and well, trouble well, like we've troubled you? Do, do what I do every day of my life, is you aim for the stars, and with luck, you'll fall on top of the trees. So you aim for the Eddie Earns, and you end up talking to Frank Warren. <laughs> And on that note, on that bombshell, we're we'll leaving night for me, man. Good luck to you. So I have one, one final question. Is there any, um, any advice that you would give um, those folks out there that uh, like maybe haven't taken that step to, to live their lives? Um, any advice you'd give our listeners? It's so easy, and it's the easiest thing in the world to do, but it's also, in a way, the toughest. Buy a mirror, OK? Get a big mirror. Put it up in your room. Sit in front of it on your own and have a little chat with the only person that's ever going to tell you the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And ask yourself this, am I really prepared to pay the price I have to pay to achieve my dreams? And am I capable of doing it? And don't bullshit yourself, because bullshit don't last on the street. Barry Hearn, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you, Barry. Good to talk. Well done, mate. Appreciate well done. it. Thank What's you. Up, thank oh. you very much, Barry. Cheers. Almost enjoyable. There we are. What can I say? Almost. Something went almost. almost. Thank you guys so much for watching to the end. We hope you liked this one as much as we did. It was a real honor to be able to film at Matchroom headquarters and it was just such a stunning place and everyone was so lovely there. So thank you, Barry, for allowing us to film there with you. Remember to share this with your loved ones and anyone you think might be inspired by this. We would also love if you could comment two things wherever you're listening. If you don't have a comment section, just shoot us a message on Instagram at rocketpodmedia. We would love to know who do you want us to interview next and one burning question you have for them. If yours gets chosen, then you'll get a special shout out in the video and we will ask your question. Take care and we'll see you in the next one.